In my first maths cast on the scalar product of two vectors, I introduced the definition of the scalar product using the magnitudes of the vectors and the cosine of the angle between them. In the second maths cast, I went on to show that this definition leads to an alternative version of the dot product in terms of the components of the vectors. This alternative version is useful in its own right. You may recall that it looks like this. Although we call this a product, it's not really the same as what you get when you multiply just two numbers. Conceptually, it's something quite different from the product of two numbers. When we're very young, we learn about numbers, and we learn to add, subtract, multiply, and so on. As we get more secure with those processes, we start to take for granted certain properties of the processes. Properties such as 2 plus 3 is the same as 3 plus 2, or 5 times 8 is the same as 8 times 5, or 2 multiplied by 6 plus 7 is the same as 2 multiplied by 6 add 2 multiplied by 7. Later, when we meet new quantities such as vectors, complex numbers, or matrices, there's a danger that we will carry our assumptions about the properties as prejudices and take them for granted even though they may no longer be valid. Whenever we start to do new kinds of arithmetic, such as the one we see here, the scalar product, it's really important that we check that it satisfies all our previous prejudices or establish when it doesn't satisfy them. I want to start with a property known as the commutative property. I already mentioned it for numbers. 2 times 3 is the same as 3 times 2. The order doesn't matter. Does that property hold for the dot product? Are a dot b and b dot a the same? We can't take it for granted. We ought to check it. In front of us we already have the definition of a dot b, so I don't need to write that down again. It's the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second times the cos of the angle between them. Let me now take that definition and use it to write down b dot a as well. There it is. The angle between is the same, of course. The only difference is that the magnitudes of b and a are in the opposite order. But those magnitudes are just numbers, and we know that numbers do commute. That is to say, the order of multiplying them doesn't matter. So here it becomes quite clear that a dot b and b dot a are the same quantity. We say that the scalar product is commutative. That means that we don't have to care about what order we use the vectors in in the product. Later on, when you learn about the vector product, or when you learn about matrix multiplication, you'll find that those products are not commutative. The order is important. Let's move on now and look at another property that probably we've taken for granted, but we should really have checked. Suppose lambda is an ordinary scalar, a number. Let's multiply the vector b by lambda and then take the dot product with a. I think most people would probably guess that we could pull the lambda to the front and just do lambda times a dot b. But is it true that we can do that? We really should check it. So I've written an equal sign but then a question mark next to it. Is it really true? We need to go back to the definition again. The definition tells us that the left hand side is the magnitude of a times the magnitude of lambda b times the cosine of the angle between the vectors. Lambda b is just a multiple of b, so it maintains the same direction as b. That means that the angle theta is the same as before. The same as that between a and b. What about that magnitude lambda b? Well, let's be really pedantic about it and expand it out in terms of the components. There's the vector lambda b. Now we need to take the squares of the components, add them up, and take the square root. Here's the first step. Then if we square the brackets, we'll find that lambda squared is a factor. If we pull the lambda squared out of the square root, it will become lambda outside. But then what's left inside is just the sum of the squares of components of b. So we get lambda times the length of b. 
In doing this, we've learned that a scalar multiple of a vector can be pulled outside when we take the length. We can now use that in our dot product. Look at the right-hand side that I've just circled. I can pull that lambda out. But now lambda is just a number, so it can be pulled to the left. What's left is then just the dot product of A with B. As a result, we have proved what we suspected in the first place, that an overall multiple of the vector can be pulled to the front before doing the dot product. It was necessary to prove it, though. We were not entitled to assume it. A slightly more complicated one is the distributive property. That's a big word, but it just means the property that we use when we multiply out brackets. The question here is, is it true that a dot b plus c is equal to the sum of the separate dot products? Actually, I already assumed this at one point in my second maths cast. I assumed it when I wrote out the dot product of two vectors in components and then expanded brackets. Perhaps I shouldn't have assumed it. Perhaps I should have checked it first. I nearly fell into a trap here. One way you might think you could prove this is to actually write out all the components of A, B and C and then just show that the equation works. The trouble is that our component expression for the dot product was derived assuming that the distributive property works. We can't assume that it works, prove a result and then use that result to go back and prove that the distributive property is true. That's going in circles. It's false logic. I'm afraid what I need to do here again is to use the definition. That needs a little geometric picture to make it clear. Before drawing the picture, let's use the definition of the dot product to make it clear what I need to prove. The left-hand side is the length of A times the length of B plus C times the cos of the angle between A and B plus C. I've called that angle Psi here, the Greek letter Psi. On the right-hand side, we will need the angle between A and B and the angle between A and C. Let's call those angles theta and phi, respectively. In a minute, I'm going to have to put all of these angles onto one diagram. But for the moment, I'll just write out the dot products on the right-hand side. This at least shows us what we've got to prove. And notice that we can make a small simplification now, because the length of A appears throughout, so we can cancel it off. That leaves me with a slightly simpler version of the equation I've got to prove. I now need to do the picture. It looks like this. I've just done a head-to-tail addition of B and C to make B plus C, and marked in the angles between each of the vectors and the direction A. The dotted line next to the angle phi, of course, is parallel to A. I'm now going to mark in two lengths. Once I do that, I think you'll see that the result holds true. I've called them X and Y. But can you see that X must be the length of B multiplied by cos theta? And on the other hand, Y must be the length of C times cos of phi. But then finally, if we go the whole length of x plus y, that's the length of b plus c times the cos of psi. That actually now has proved the result that we wanted. The length of b plus c cos psi is x plus y, but that's length of b cos theta plus length of c cos phi. We could now multiply this result by the length of a, and that shows us that the dot product is in fact distributive. It says well that we found that result because I did actually assume it in the first place. It does show you though that things are not always straightforward. I want to show you two final properties which are a little bit simpler to understand. Here's the dot product again. What if the angle between A and B is 90 degrees? So that they're perpendicular. Well, then we can substitute 90 degrees into the cosine. And then remembering that cos of 90 degrees is 0, we find that the dot product is 0. 
If two vectors are perpendicular, it doesn't matter what the vectors are, their dot product is zero. What about the other way around though? Suppose a dot b is zero, can we assume the vectors are perpendicular? Let's write down the equation a dot b equals zero using the definition of a dot b. Well now the lengths and the cos theta are just numbers. When you multiply numbers and get zero, then the individual numbers, at least one of them, must be zero. So we actually have a choice. We could have length of a zero, or length of b zero, or possibly both, or cos of theta equals zero. For a, length, a vector to have length zero, it can only be the zero vector itself. So we found that if the dot product is zero, then either one or both of the vectors involved are the zero vector, or if they are not, then the angle between them must be 90 degrees. This is something a bit new about the scalar product. We know that if two numbers multiply to give zero, then one or both of them must be zero, and there's no alternative. Here with the dot product of vectors, there is an alternative. The vectors could themselves be non-zero, but they might be perpendicular. That also gives a scalar product equal to zero. I'm going to finish by using this property to derive some interesting results about the dot product with a cross product of two vectors. I'll have to assume that you know roughly what the cross product is. If you don't know what it is, then you'll need to go and look at MathsCasts or read up about it separately. I want to look at dot products of the form a dot a cross b. It turns out that this dot product can be simplified very easily. It doesn't even matter what the vectors a and b are. Think about it for a moment. The vector product, that is the cross product, is a new vector which is perpendicular to both a and b. That's its definition. So this dot product is the dot product of a with another vector which is perpendicular to a. It doesn't matter what the b is, the angle between a and a cross b will have to be 90 degrees. Cos of 90 is zero, so this dot product must be zero, regardless of b. This is a very useful result to know and it saves us a lot of work just to be able to set such things to zero. This mathscast is getting a bit long now, so I'm going to conclude.